I want you to turn to First John. We won't. Uh, I, I want you to know where we are in the in the flow of the book. Some of you uh, might not have, uh, you know, been keeping up, or you might not remember where we've been. Of course, I'm surprised sometimes at people that let us know they're watching online. Not that it's surprising that people watch online, or I guess too surprising that people would actually want to hear what I have to say online. But uh, but you just you forget you forget about it. So um, some of those might not be as familiar as well, but. Um, the thesis of the book of the preacher's sermon, the Ecclesiast, Kohelet, vanity of vanities, that hevel, emptiness, it's that brief nothingness. It's hard to describe it with any substance whatsoever because as soon as you've defined it or described it, it's gone. And the context is that this thesis is true under the sun. Time with no regard for eternity. Earth with no regard for heaven. Man with no regard for God. That's where this thesis holds its truth. That everything about this life and life itself is the pinnacle, the ultimate in useless, empty, meaningless, in the word we get in the authorized version, vanity. So there's a work of art I've thought about showing to you that uh, represents it, it. From a distance, it looks like a, a, a skull. It's very... It's a gruesome looking thing, uh, but it looks like just a skull, just, you know, the eye sockets and the teeth and everything. But if you look closely at it, you realize it's the silhouette outline of a woman sitting at a vanity, you know, I guess grooming, getting, you know, preparing herself. And that's the whole idea is vanity, is that what's behind all the facade ultimately is, uh, is the nothingness, the nearness of death and the nothingness of life. And it, whew, morbid, of course. That's what Solomon has run up against. That's the context. Is inside in this life under heaven, what is there to behold? His great question we found in verse 3, what profit is a man of all the labor he takes under the sun? What's the profit? And of course, that's what he's going to espouse. He gives the for instances from the natural world, from the human idea of, or side of things, the four examples that he marches us through. Last week, we looked at his experiment because this is where he moves in from those preliminary stages where, like a good preacher, he's going to tell you not only what he's going to... Well, he doesn't just tell you the message. He tells you beforehand, this is what I'm going to tell you. It's like in an academic paper, the thesis that states what you're about to read, and this is what I'm about to prove, and the questions I'm about to answer, and here's where I believe we'll arrive at the end. That's where a good thesis or a good research paper, that's how it ought to be written and conducted. And he does that right here. But it's not just an academic research paper. This is a work of prose. It's a work of of poetry. This is the feelings of his heart. And he says, I was the king over Israel, in Jerusalem. One man. Really, besides David. No claim by David to have written this. It must be Solomon. That's his credentials. And by the way, tonight we'll see more of his credentials that matter to the content. His companion, his, his experiment partner is his heart, his lev. The thing that is the center of his, of his will, of the direction of the things that he's going to pursue in life. That's that Hebrew idea of the heart. It doesn't detach itself from the sentiments, but it certainly doesn't resolve itself on the sentiments. It springs from there. They, they erupt from it. They're not the center of it. So this is the, the compass of his life, the lev. That's his, com that's his companion. And his conclusions were that it's a tiresome pursuit. It's an empty pursuit. It's a grievous pursuit. Doesn't sound too encouraging, but he's telling us right up front, this is what I did and this is what I found. But now he's going to tell us about the experiment. The reason I had you go to 1 John is in chapter 2, verse number 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. There's a comma right there. It could just as easily be a colon. Okay, there's a list that follows. All right? Here's what's in the world. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. So if you, want to, if, if you ever struggle with what the term worldly means, you've got the answer very plain and clear in 1 John 2, 15, 16, 17. The, a worldly thing is something that pertains or connects to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now, when I was in high, when I was in elementary school, parachute pants were worldly. 
parachute pants. Those were worldly, okay? And maybe they were, okay? But uh, at the time, it, it gave me the idea, as, as, a, as a simplistic young man, that, that there were particular things that either were or were not worldly based on whether or not the world was doing them. Well, that's, that's kind of got the cart before the horse. The idea is that the things that the world does are motivated by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's how the world operates. That's its instinctive reaction to everything. I dare you. Read the paper, watch the news, check your social media pages, and gauge them by those three <coughs> criteria. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you will see worldliness from some of your most Christian friends in things that you would never have necessarily called worldly. Why? Because we as inhabitants, broken inhabitants of a broken world, it's our default setting. Okay? It's our default setting. It's only by the grace of God that it's overcome. But in 1 John, we get a warning. Woo, it's a red flag warning. Don't love those things. Don't pursue them. And here's what it says. These are not of the Father. They're of the world. And the world passeth away. Let, let me insert a word that's not in this text. It's not what it is. I'm just going to put it in so it directs our minds. Because the world is vain. It's empty. It's vanity. Now, it may not be linguistically the same thing, but interpretationally, the meaning is right on with what we're talking about with Solomon. The world is temporary, and it's empty. It's meaningless. It's nothingness. The world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So with that in mind, as we move towards now the second chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, and you can be turning over there, I'm going to start us tonight as you're turning with a statement from a man uh, from, the, I guess, the 17th century, a scholar named Cartwright. And it will kind of bookend, it may not bookend by the way that I say it, but I want it to kind of be a, a companion in the way we pursue this, not just tonight, but in the coming weeks. We won't continually go back to 1 John, I don't think, but I, I want it to just be that, I want it to be that, that ruler that sits beside it that you go, yep, yeah, there it is, there it is again. So that you can always kind of keep it in reference. But I like this statement that closes chapter 2 and brings us to chapter, or closes chapter 1 and brings us to chapter 2. Which is this grief and sorrow, not happiness and rest, were the harvest of the soil. In other words, that's what Solomon found. Remember he said, these things are grievous and they are toilsome. They're sorrowful. And this is what Cartwright said. God had never sown man's happiness in this world. How then shall we here reap it? It's a great understanding. How are we hoping to bring out of this world what was never there? God has never intended for us to find our happiness here. Not because he's lied to us and he feels threatened by the happiness we will find here. He knows that we were made for a different world. Not this broken shell, this vain world. And so... How then shall we even think that we shall reap it here? The experiments of Solomon are plainly a venture into the best of what the world has to offer. And while we may not call constant attention to John's descriptions of the world, it will be helpful to maintain this as a backdrop reference. He is amusing himself. Amusing. Oh, Greek word, museon. And if you take that little aleph and put it in front of uh, that's the Hebrew. If you take the alpha. You know, if you take that alpha and put it in front, it negates it. So it's almost like an, uh, a not musing. Well, if you know what it is to muse, it's to ponder, to think. And that word's undergone kind of a, an evolution over time as to what it means and how it comes into our, our vernacular. But in its essence, when you go to an amusement park, you go there to not think a lot, right? Not ponder. It's not a place for intellectual stimulation, okay? It's the kind of place where you check your brain at the door and crawl onto 80 and 90 and 200-foot towers and drop quickly. That's not what reasonable, rational people, thinking people do. That's what thrill-seeking people do. And it's fun. It's loads of fun, okay? But we pay all kinds of money to go amuse ourselves. Well, Solomon's going to describe his experiments in amusement. Uh, I've kind of co-labeled them uh, amusement and achievement. So let's look at chapter 2. It says this, I said in mine heart. Same thing he said back in 16 where he, he re-emphasizes. I said, hey, I, 
in conjunction with my heart. That's, that, that's what's built into the Hebrew right there. Go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. He's speaking to his heart. I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, mad. You see that it is, is in italics right there? The Hebrew doesn't require it to say what we need those words to say in English, so we, we might even simplify it back. It wouldn't be as helpful, but it might clarify to go, laughter, mad, or madness. What of mirth? What doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards. Now, as we go through this, I'm going to highlight some of these I'm looking to get to verse 11 tonight. We're not going to spend time in his achievements. They're here to be noted. They're not the focus. Okay, so I'm not going to focus on them. But I'll kind of, I want to, I want to highlight something as we go through. First of all, we get his architectural achievements, if you want to put a, a label on it. I've builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them. Of all kind of fruits, I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. And we see his administrational achievements. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. Those were his material achievements. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings. And of the provinces, I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. His artistic achievements. Now, the achievements are not the thing that occupy. It's the experience of them. So don't lock in on looking towards a finish line as though I finished the gardens, I finished the houses, I have, I, I, I've, I've written the work or I've listened to the, to the, to the music. No, no. It's the experience of these things. But did you see the word repeated again and again? I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me <coughs> vineyards. The Hebrew would be leaf to me or for me. Okay, it is overtly clear that everything that he was doing, that he was doing was self-serving, self-inflating, self-indulging. Verse 9, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Now in verse 1, you see where it said, therefore enjoy pleasure. Well, in verse 10, my heart, I withheld not my heart from any joy. It did what it was asked. So verse 11, then I looked. On all the works. I, I stand back and I observe on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. He's not coming to the conclusion. He's reminding you that's been the conclusion all along. But we're having to watch him or we're, we're being granted an insight into how he already knew it. And defying our, kind of our conventional wisdom that says, if you're going to enjoy this world, then you're going to have to get all you can of its delights. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Father, guide us through this text tonight. May it not simply be information. Certainly, we want to retain and absorb this information, but God, so that it would persuade us, that it would investigate our hearts and, like a searchlight, uncover those things in us that are worldly pursuits. 
Father, we trust your Holy Spirit to do this work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Essentially, verses 1 through 3 cover the terms of the experiment. And it's, it, doesn't, it feels maybe a little official to go through this, but it's what Solomon does. I said in my heart, go to now or come with me. That's kind of the Bahana, okay? It's, a, it, it's not even a translatable uh, p a plea, it's, it, but it's, a, it's something that just says, hey, if, if you'll come with me, I'm going to show you something. So come on. And it, it's, it's translated this way. It's a little awkward for us to say, go to now. That's an awkward thing for us. But it's essentially just an invitation. Come on. I want you to see something. Come with me. So come on. And what are you going to see? Therefore, I will prove thee with mirth. Now, we're going to define some of these terms as we go. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. So he sets out the goal. He sets out the goal. I'm going to prove you. And this word comes from a Hebrew word, nasa. There's a couple of words that, that, that are pronounced that way. This one's spelled differently, even though it's got the same sound, okay? The, the general idea of this word, nasa, this proving word, is the idea of training, of testing, which is conveyed to us by the word prove. But in the stem, and we won't talk about the, the grammatical changes, but we, we understand that words are used in different ways, so the terminology is fluid, and we don't always mean, uh, we don't always mean the word see by the word see. Sometimes I, I see what's in front of me. Sometimes I see your point. Sometimes I say I've seen it all. We, we have various ways we use this. The Hebrew shows us that in various ways, just like the English can. Sometimes it's in the way that it's written, not just in the way that it's used. In this particular stem, it doesn't make a lot of sense on the surface to say that I'm going to test my heart, that I'm going to somehow find out what, what, what's in my heart, because what he's talking about is introducing things to the heart. The idea here would be the training of equipping. In other words, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to bring to you something, and what am I going to bring to you? What am I going to, what am I going to equip you with in this pursuit? Mirth. Mirth. There's a key term. We'll go ahead and we'll kind of go ahead and get it. Hold on it now. Samea. Very common Hebrew word. Matter of fact, it, we just passed Rosh Hashanah or Rosh Hashanah, which is the new Rosh Hashanah, a new year. And if you wanted to tell someone, hey, happy holiday, because it's Rosh Hashanah in, in, in Israel, you would have said Chag Sameach. In other words, feast happy. Adjective follows the, the, the noun. Hog Sameach. Man, enjoy the holiday. Happy holidays, that's the word, okay? So Hog Sameach, all right? Well, it's simply enjoyment, delight. I'm going to equip you with gladness. Now, is there anything intrinsically bad about that? I would say no. Why? Because delight is a part of what reflects our creator in us. But as with most, or I should say, really, all things that represent the devil's best advances toward us, they are generally good things twisted or taken to the wrong end or bent to the wrong purpose. Whether it's the, whether it's the idea of pleasure of the physical body. What does the devil say? The devil says, enjoy it at your will. The Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled. There's a place. There's a place that it's to be enjoyed. Fire is good in the fireplace, not, in the, not on the living room floor. Okay, there's a place for it to be enjoyed. There's a place for it to be profitable. C.S. Lewis goes into this in the screw tape letters where it's a, it's a if you've ever read it, it's a really interesting book. It's a conversation between an elder demon and a younger demon. It's a fictional work, but the idea is how he's going to undo the world in this attacks on this one particular individual. And you've got to read it backwards because when he talks about the enemy, he's talking about God. And he says this. He says, we of our side have never... We've never created anything that actually brings true joy. It's always been our goal to twist what the enemy, which is God, to twist what the enemy has given and push man towards an unhealthy obsession with it. And we see that again and again, even in terms like justice, where justice becomes an end without any kind of a reference. And people pursue it such that they're willing to perform injustices in the name of justice. 
You see how all these things that we pervert from the world are not intrinsically bad, but it's a testament to our brokenness and the devil's ploys that we have seen them perverted and then pursued. So he tells his heart, I'm going to prove you with gladness. Sounds great, but as we saw a minute ago, th th these things are all going to be very self-serving. They're going to be very indulgent. So we we've looked ahead and realized they're not going to be done in a healthy way, and we already realized the context is under the sun. It's completely ignoring God, eternity, and the heavens. There's nothing about it that's going to actually be guided well. All right? I'm going to prove you with mirth. He gives a specific instruction. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. Enjoy pleasure. I talked about the word see, as in seeing something. I see a, a, a pew or a, or a hymn book, or I see your point, or I've seen it all. We use that word differently. The Hebrew word here is see, ra'ah. Sometimes that word means to, to provide or to, to understand or realize or come to grasp or discover. It's got a various range of, of understandings. And in this point, to see is to take it in. And that's kind of what Solomon says to his heart. Man, I'm going to equip you with gladness. And you know what? Take it all in. Just, just immerse yourself in the pleasure of it and just enjoy. Make yourself at home in it. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. And that brings the predictable result. <laughs> this is what Solomon does immediately. Behold, this is also vanity. Now, I didn't read the full phrase, did I? I left out a word. It says, and, comma, behold, this is also vanity. Now, this, is, this comma is, is added in there for us. None of the, none of the punctuation is in the original text. So it's all there because that makes a lot of sense. But I find it interesting that the translators put that. Why? Because that makes us pause on it and brings a significance to it. It's not simply that we're listing a chain of events. This is a pause. This is a stop. Why? Because he's telling us and behold, hine, look, take a look at this. Why? Here's what you're going to find. It's all vanity. I mean, he just said enjoy it. Take it all in. Just, oh man, Sit back and relax, and you'll, you'll have to, to your contentment all the pleasure you want. And you know what? You'll find out it's empty. Now remember, he's not building the case up to where we understand all of these things are meaningless and empty. He's already told us it all is. Now he's describing the process. So it's, there is a proving. There is a, there, there is a testing of his hypothesis what he's doing is telling his heart, you're going you're gonna to find out exactly what I've told you. Now, this seems a little strange that he's having this conversation with his heart, but that's how he's bringing this truth to us. That's how the Lord has communicated it to us in, in, this, in this literary manner. This also is vanity. And you might even put it this way. You'll see for yourself. That's paraphrasing this. You'll see for yourself that all of this was empty. Now, that's the terms of the experiment. So he's laid out the groundwork. In verse 2, he gives us what I've called some pre-observations. It's probably not the best word, but it's the way I'm thinking about this. Some pre-observations. He's going to sum it up with a couple of words. On one side are the good things, all right? Laughter. I said of laughter, it is man. And of mirth, what doeth it? Now, sometimes this is viewed as a, as a separate pursuit from the following verses. It's a, it's a great perspective. I don't see that perspective. What I see right here is yet again where he's deducing. He's starting from the big concepts and working us down to the details of where he discovered it. And what are all of these things going to pursue? Mirth, laughter, happiness, sameach. In other words, if, if, we're, if, we're, if we achieve all of these things, in theory, what are we going to do? We're going to laugh a whole lot. What are we going to have after all this? We're going to have lots of happiness, lots of gladness and joy. By, that word, by the way, that word sameach, 94 times in the Old Testament, 75 of them is joy or gladness is the word that's brought to us in the text. So it, it's a very easy word for us to grasp. We know the things that for us represent joy and gladness. And it's there that I have to pause and ask you, isn't this essentially what the majority of the world thinks of or is pursuing 
by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you ask the average person, what do you want, there's no telling what they might say. But the reason they want it, and if you could, if you could ask the question such that they tell you this, I think you're probably going to hear, because I want to be happy. They may say, I want to be rich. But why do they want to be rich? Because they think riches makes them happy. I want to be famous. Why? Because famous will make me happy. Well, what do you have there? You have the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, just in those two things right there. I want to live a life, where, uh, 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 I, want to, I want to build myself up and look beautiful. I want to have all the pretty things and all the nice things. Why? Because these elements of the world will bring me happiness. And along the way, man, we will laugh and we'll enjoy it. Now, that's the pursuit. They're, they're kind of the benchmark standard. I mean, even written into our Constitution is the right to pursue happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I don't want to get political, but it doesn't guarantee happiness to all its constituents. Some people think that's what it is. It guarantees you the opportunity to pursue it. But we all want to pursue it. Even the world wants to pursue it. As a matter of fact, the world thinks that is what is to be pursued. And what do we have here? We have case A number one of the pursuit of happiness. And so he goes ahead and answers the question. He said, you're going to find out what I've already found out. You're going to find out what I've already studied, which is what? Vanity. So he asks these questions. What is laughter? What is laughter? I said of laughter, or regarding laughter, it is madness. What an interesting word. Root word is halal. You've said this word many times. And if not, you should say it many times. Because it is the root verb for hallelujah. I said too many L's. Hallelujah. There we go. Got it right that time. Hallelujah. Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise. You praise. It's an imperative. You praise Yah, the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 Yah. So it's praise ye, praise ye, praise ye, praise ye, the Lord, praise ye, the Lord. So we just say it over and over again. And it's a good song and we enjoy it around kids. We can get them to scream and holler. Now why would it be that he uses the word halal right here? Because again, that interesting Hebrew language that can be so frustrating to learn sometimes has a stem in which this word almost takes on the opposite meaning. And the idea is of madness. Of something that is to be almost mocked or derided. The picture we can get, it, one of the clearest pictures, is David in 1 Samuel 21. David is in exile. He is, he is fleeing for his life from Saul, who's pursuing him. And he goes down to Gath and to the king there who is Achish, and he's afraid for his life. And so what does he do to try to preserve his life? He fakes being mad. He fakes halal or maholed. He fakes madness. And why does he do this? Because he thinks they'll take pity on him. And he's right. Achish says, get this guy out of my kingdom. Well, get him out of, get him out of here. Why do I want this guy here? Look at how great he was. He, he's, he's a lunatic. Now, he continues on with the description of David as a, as a madman, and that's exactly what it is. Solomon here describes it the same way. The end of laughter, or really the product of laughter, is insanity. That's really where he's driving here. It's insanity. Wow, that's, that's a harsh term. He says, I've been there. Maybe he has. He says, I've done that. It sure seems like he has. He says, what is laughter? Well, I said, this is what laughter amount, amounts to. Madness. And what of mirth? What doeth it? <laughs> Strange one. What does happiness do? I don't think happiness does anything. Or we might say, what does it accomplish? Okay, so you're happy. What have you got for it? Well, I got happiness. I know, but what does that, what does that actually mean? Well, it means I'm not sad. Well, that's good, but what is actually a part of your happiness? I can enjoy this life. Okay, how long will you have it? Until the next thing that makes me unhappy, which could be five years from now. It's more likely five minutes from now. So it's fleeting. So it never actually accomplishes anything. Why? Because it's not a thing. It's vanity. He said it's emptiness. 
I, I, I meant to bring us a, a visual tonight to bring maybe like a big tub or a big pot that's clear so you could see through it. Maybe like those, those big things we used to make sweet tea in at Kent Maranatha. They were just big old tall, mostly clear, you know, big pots that you could dip out of, dip the sweet tea or Kool-Aid out of. And, and just, take a, just take a dipper with that thing and visualize dipping nothing out of it and pouring nothing over into a measuring cup. Why? To show that this is the experiment in action. It's, it's, taking a, it's taking really what Solomon would describe as a beautiful lady. Gold encrusted, gorgeous, fancy lady. I mean, it's the best looking ladle you would want. If you could have a ladle, you'd have this one. And using it to dip nothing and pour it into your life and stop whenever you hit the right measuring mark. The happiness mark. The problem is you're pulling nothing out, so you're putting nothing in. And what are you doing? You're laboring in the meantime. What does it accomplish? It accomplishes nothing because the time, by the time you look in the cup, it's gone. There's nothing there. It's a, it really is. A, it's not a great way to write a drama. Why? Because he's leaving us nothing to the imagination. He's telling us that all, that all of it up front, repetitively. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Now this word, or both these words, appear together. In Psalm 103, I'm sorry, in Psalm, uh, I'm trying to make sure I got this right. Lost it. Psalm 126, I'm sorry. In Psalm 126, David said this, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Not David, I'm sorry, but it's one of the Psalms. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter. It's halal. That's a good thing. I'm sorry, it's a, it is a different word. It's filled with laughter. That's the actual word from chapter, from verse 2 there. It's laughter. It's that joy. It's that, I mean, it is. It's, it, it's, it's the enjoyment of funny things or just really delightful things. And our tongue, well, it was filled with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are so now glad. So we've got the laughter and we've got the mirth together. But it's not madness and vanity. It's not no accomplishment. It's very, very different. And yet, in Proverbs, Solomon says this. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. We don't have to struggle with that. We know that. Why? Because we use terms like put on a good face. You can smile when you can't say a word. You can smile when you cannot be heard. We said that all the time at Kent Maranatha, and we had a good time with it. I don't know how spiritual it was, though I do understand that smiling is good to do. It's good for your health. It's good for your reputation, your testimony, and your relations in life. But we all know that we use smiles much more effectively than we use the face coverings that they're asking for in every place you go into now. Why? We know what's up under that mask. It's just a face. What's under the smile? Who knows? We walk into a church and we feel particularly obligated to put on a smile. And I don't want you coming in here grouchy. Nobody does. But we somehow think that the laughter means no sorrow. And so what do we do? We actually buy our own lie. We add to ourselves what? Laughter. We add to ourselves laughter. Now, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, which is sameach. A sameach heart. A happy heart, a glad heart, surely does good like a medicine. That's well underrated in our world, particularly in the scientific world. In a quarantine world, it's sorely missing. But the fact is, laughter is good for you. But laughter doesn't do anything to offset your sorrows when you've come face to face with vanity with despair, with nothingness in life. So the verdict on laughter and mirth is madness and vanity. What does it do? What does it accomplish? Nothing. Now in verse 3, and we've essentially, we're only going to cover these verses, jump to verse 11. So I'm not going through all, verse, all 11 verses like this. We've, we've already covered some of this. But in verse 3, he gives us a key statement to understand the way he's going to do this experiment. I saw it in mine heart, to give myself unto wine. Now this is the same man who said, look not on 
the wine and the cup when it's ready, when it moveth itself about. Don't look at it. He's the same one who warned against wine. It's a mocker. Strong drink is raging. The same one who said it's not fit for kings to drink strong drink. The same person that said this, and yet, he says, if we're going to pursue this right, we got to set that aside. Why? Because we cannot let anything stand between us and the delights of life. We've got we've to give up this part. Whatever reservation he had, spiritual or otherwise, to wine, he's willing to push that aside to say, you're going to need wine for this. And our world would say a hearty amen. You need a liquor. You need alcohol. You need strong drink to do something to stimulate the party, to get things going. And he says, I'm going to give myself to wine. Now, this would be a great place to digress, step off, and pursue the path. I'm not going to do that tonight. Maybe at another time I will. But suffice it to say, it's a companion to all of this. And I will just put a period on it by saying it's almost always a companion. To the world's mirth and laughter. Because generally they don't know what to do without it. Enough said on that. But then he goes on and he says, I saw it in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom. Now I want you to keep in mind that Solomon doesn't necessarily obsess over the things that he does. If you look down through that list again, the achievements, the architectural, uh, I didn't think I mentioned the agricultural, okay, that's just keeping those A's right there, all right, and then the administrational, all, right, all of so that's, that's good, maybe it's good outlining, I don't know. Be that as it may, you look down through there, you don't see somebody who's just obsessing. You see somebody meticulous. You see somebody meticulous in the way he's performing this experiment. So here's what he's saying, we're going to give ourselves to one, all right? But we're not going to lose sight of wisdom. Now, this is a bold, risky venture. And we've all tried it. Here's how. We thought, I shouldn't say we've all tried it. I know I have. I'm going to pursue A, B, C, or D. Like I've seen this person pursue A, B, C, or D. And it turned out poorly. They got in trouble. They got hurt. They lost on the deal. But I know better. I know the mistakes they made. There's a book by Fyodor Dostoevsky called Crime and Punishment. Famous book. And it, it is one of those, really, one of the, one of the, one of the great books that would, that would describe this mentality. Because in the book, Fyodor Dostoevsky's uh, key, uh, key character thinks he can commit a crime but not get caught. That he is wise enough to do all the things. Now, eventually, his conscience and the authorities all catch up with him. And in the end, it's a really a beautiful picture of kind of the redemptive work of love in the man's life, okay? But in the whole thing, he thinks he's got it figured out up to the point that he commits the murder and everything goes wrong. And of course, we say, but of course, that's what always happens. He should have known. And yet, we sometimes do the same things. We certainly watch young people do it. Because we warn them, this is what's going to happen, and then they do it. We warn them, this is what's going to happen, and then they do it. We warn them, we get warned. This is what's going to happen, and then we do it. Solomon actually makes the bold gamble. I'm going to do all this, but I'm going to keep my head in the meantime. I'm going to keep my head about it. So it's, under, it's, it's important to understand, he didn't go berserk in his quest for luxury. This is the way Dwayne Garrett says this. His problem was not lack of self-restraint. He retained that. He says in a minute, in a moment, we'll read it again. But any attempt to find a rationale for an existence in pleasure and affluence is bound to fail, even if that attempt is sobered by self-control. He's already told us it's going to fail, but he says, I did it, and I kept my head the whole time. I'm going to lay hold on wisdom. I'm going to keep hold on wisdom, but I'm also going to embrace folly. All the madness, all the insanity of laughter. I'm going to gather it all up into this. Into what? Into my heart. Into my experiment. This is what he's equipping his partner with. All of these things. Till I might see what was that good. What was that good for the sons of men which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. So that the experiment's set. It's ready. And he takes it on. I built me. I made me. I got me. 
I have you. I got more. What? To me, to me, to me, to me, to me. And in verse 9, so I was great. It worked. It worked. Who was bigger? Who was better? And by the way, who else could have written this? Not just who was king over Israel and Jerusalem, but coupled with that, who else could have pulled this off to achieve all of the achievements? That's a redundant, but to, to actually do all of the things that he planned to do and do them well. And also, so I was great and increased more than all that were that before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. He did what you and I would not be able to do. He actually kept his head. Now, I have read some who postulate that perhaps he built in uh, to his administration around him checks and balances where he would make sure that almost like we would have people that suggest a designated driver. So go out and do something foolish and then make sure your foolishness doesn't kill someone. That's a really kind of rough way to explain that. But in a, in a sense, some think that's what he did, that he built systems in to make sure that all of his foolishness wouldn't cost him too much. You say, well, that sounds rational. Well, it's not rational if you want to do right, but if you want to enjoy the pleasures of life, he had the money. He had the wit. He had the human resources. He had the material resources to do everything in verse 10 that he says, whatsoever mine eyes desired, I didn't tell him no. And he's already said, the eyes can see, they're never filled. He's already said, he said it twice, chapter 1. But whatever they wanted, Go for it. Do it. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced. He said, therefore, heart enjoy pleasure. And you know what the heart did? It lived it up. It had a great time. This was my portion of all my labor. This is what it is. There's the report. Mission accomplished. Everything I wanted to achieve, I did it. And man, Loads of fun, lots of laughter. I mean, I mean, it worked except this. Then I looked. Then I stepped back. I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. In terms of our illustration, I looked at the measuring cup. And behold, empty. All was vanity, vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Everything I've told you that was going to be true, you're going to see. Behold, just see for yourself. It was true. The measuring cup was still empty. I was still as empty as when I started with less money, less energy, and less time left in my life. I didn't even break even. Didn't even break even. But it was great. This plan worked perfectly. There's a self-defeating element to all of this, or I should say it's a defeating thing for us to watch. But it's healthy for us to see it, and I'm glad God preserved it for us. Why? Because if we ever dared think that we could do this experiment, what do you have in your life, in your bank account, in your resources, that you think you could improve on Solomon's plan? I mean, how are you going to improve on it? What are you going to achieve? Now think long and hard or just come to the realization really quickly. If there was any, ever anybody in history who could have pulled this off, it was Solomon. And Solomon pulled it off and he says, it did exactly what I told you it was going to do. It brought me to despair. In August 2014, at age 63, Robin Williams committed suicide by hanging at his home in Ironically enough, Paradise Key, California. There's a fellow comedian of that generation. And I remember that's just been six years ago, y'all. Six years ago. And I remember one of his, not one of his contemporaries, but a younger comedian who had produced some vile movies. Thank the Lord I've never seen them, trying to steer people away from them. But his name was Russell Brand. And Russell Brand wrote an incredible article memorializing the life of Robin Williams just a few days after Robin Williams' suicide. It's going to take just a couple of minutes, but I'm going to read to you what Russell Brand, a man not from a Christian or biblical or even religious context. And I want you to hear what he says about Robin Williams' life and death. And I want you to hear the echoes of Solomon's words. Robin Williams was exciting to me because he seemed to be sat upon a geyser of comedy. 
like he didn't manufacture it laboriously within, but had only to open a valve and it would come bursting through in effervescent jets. He was plugged into the mains of comedy. Everybody knows who Robin Williams is. If anybody isn't familiar, you'll have to look it up later. Honestly, one of the most well-known and funniest people of the last 30 years, maybe longer than that. He spoke candidly about his mental illness and addiction, how he felt often on a precipice of self-destruction, whether through substance abuse or some act of more certain finality. I thought that this articulation, this acknowledgement, amounted to a kind of vaccine against the return of such thinking, which has proven, of course, to be hopelessly naive. When someone gets to 63, I imagine, I hoped, I suppose that maturity would grant an immunity to adolescent notions of suicide. But today I read that suicide isn't exclusively a young man's game. Robin Williams at 63 still hadn't come to terms with being Robin Williams. It seems that Robin Williams could not find a context. Is that what drug use is? An attempt to anesthetize, to, to numb himself against a reality that constantly knocks against your nerves, like a tinfoil on an old school filling. Is it melancholy to think that a world that Robin Williams can't live in must be broken? Poor Robin Williams briefly enduring that lonely moment of morbid certainty, where it didn't matter how funny he was or who loved him or how many grand obituaries would be written about. He could have tapped anyone in the Western world on the shoulder and told them he felt down, and they would have told him not to worry, that he, was, that he was great, that they loved him. He must have known that. He must have known his wife and kids loved him, that his friends all thought he was great, that millions of strangers the world over held him in their hearts as a hilarious stranger that we could rely on to interrupt all our mess. The all-encompassing sadness of the world. Today, Robin Williams is part of that encompassing sadness, that sad narrative from which we used to turn to him in order to disrupt. What then can we cast down along with the insufficient reeds at his tomb, alongside the stillness that was once so animated in Robin Williams, so wired alongside the silence where the laughter once was? Brand says, I am mindful today how fragile we all are, how delicate we are, even when fizzing with divine madness that seems like it will never expire. Now, I consolidated the article into a few paragraphs, but did you hear how one comedian saw another and realized that Robin Williams' life, part of the genius of his comedy, was his very self-destruction? That what he sought to do Never was the salve that cured him. And so in the end, his comedy couldn't salve others. What is it? It was a divine madness, he calls it. I'd like to say it was a non-divine madness. It was the madness that comes under the sun. Charles Bridges, 17th century author, records a warning. And says, let the earth be the cistern only, not the fountain. Let it be the placeholder. Not the well. Maybe Thoreau Harris said it best. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Amen. He is more than life to me. Amen. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. I was almost emotional thinking through again and remembering. The day Robin Williams did what he did, and we all reckoned with someone who looked on the outside and laughed on the outside like life was good. And on the inside, we all realized it was empty. It was empty. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is surely not in you. The world passes Day to do the will of the Father. That's here to stay. Amen. Father, we thank you for grim reminders, even though we don't rejoice in them. We take note.
We don't know what walked in this auditorium tonight. We don't know walked, what walked in the basement downstairs. But we know that the majority of it would be hopes upon empty things to bring satisfaction. And yet we look at Solomon as the one individual, or at least one of the very, very few in history, who would have had any chance to actually achieve this experiment. To do everything his heart could desire and not lose himself completely in the process and go insane over it. To somehow retain himself and yet in the end be there to tell us there's nothing there. It's empty. Father, remind us tonight of the thrill of our soul that is Jesus Christ. That one that has come down out of eternity and into time. So that we might not live this life with a, with a brass shield around this earth that prevents us from escaping the craziness of this world. But opens the door to heaven. Father, remind us again of the joy that's in Jesus Christ and of the anguish that's everywhere else. So that our hearts would truly say, give me Jesus. I'd rather have him than anything this world affords today. We pray this all in the precious and lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.